Welcome to our first policy conversation, our first policy event of the 2014-2015 school year. Congratulations to all of you for starting the school year. And uh, I want to welcome all of the, the new and familiar faces. It's great to, uh, to meet some of you for the first time. And I want to welcome everyone back who's been an active members of E4E for some time now. Tonight we have a, uh, a really exciting conversation, one that, as you know, has been, has been ripe for debate and discussion both uh, within schools, outside of schools, in the media. And I was very excited when our teachers chose to write a paper on it, researching, exploring the ideas, debating assessment and testing as an issue, because obviously it impacts everything that happens in our schools, particularly some of the new transformative policies like Common Core State Standards and teacher evaluation. So I want to welcome you all tonight. I want to really applaud the work of the teacher policy team who, uh, who, who wrote this paper, who spent, who spent long nights debating the issues, reading, that, reading the dense research, coming to conclusions, really exploring these ideas. So if you're, if, you're on one of the, if you're on the teacher policy team on testing and assessment, if you can just stand up for a second so people can applaud you. Some of them are actually in the back room, so you have to applaud loudly. Um, and thank you. Again, some of them are actually on the panel, so they'll be coming out of the green room. Uh, they'll, they'll get more applause in a second. And, you know, we hope that tonight you'll take this conversation beyond this room and, and, and tweet and, and post, uh, post on Facebook what you're hearing, what you're thinking about, any questions you have. Um, we, and we really want to just get started tonight. So I'm, I'm excited to ex introduce one of, our, um, one of our E4E teacher leaders, Vivek Himans. Uh, she's a teacher from the Eagle Academy for, of Young Men in Southeast Queens, and she's a member of the policy team that actually wrote this paper. So welcome, Vivette. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome. My name is Vivette Hemans, and I'm so glad you all made it out tonight for what I'm sure will be a lively and really interesting discussion about this most important topic of testing. I want to start tonight with just a little bit of background information. So today we'll start with our introductions, then we'll move into our panel discussion, followed by questions from you, our distinguished audience. So start thinking about your questions now. And then we'll end with a reception just outside of the auditorium. So at E4E, our mission is firmly rooted in having the voices of classroom teachers be at the pinnacle of everything we do to ensure that we teachers are heard, that you teachers are heard when policies get made. One of the biggest reasons I joined E4E was because they value my voice as a teacher, as the expert in the classroom. They were not looking to outside agencies or governances to decide what should be done in education. They look to the teachers for that vital information and I really value them for the value that they place on us as teachers. So a little bit about what we do at e for e Tonight is a great example of how our members come together to do three things. We learn, we network, and we take action. So we learn on and offline about education news and research and policy. We network with teachers and policymakers at forums like this and conferences. And we take action by pursuing changes that elevate not only student achievement, but our profession overall. And that is exemplified in the policy paper that was written by myself and several colleagues. We'd like to spend a little time to just go over our conversation norms, which any of us who are familiar with E4E e know that these norms drive all of our conversations, whether, whether they're in forums like this, whether we're meeting back at the office. I've actually adopted these um, norms in my classroom because they just, they just work. So all of our conversations at E4E e start with assuming best intentions, then ensuring that many voices are heard, and finally, we always want to stay solutions oriented. So we invite you all to please share this most important conversation. It's very important that this conversation does not just remain in this room because it simply is too important to keep it to ourselves. So please, if you wanna share the conversation, do so and include the hashtag E4ENY. 
You can also see how to access the auditorium's wireless network. I believe the passwords are the same book and book. I'm super excited to introduce our moderators tonight. They're really two terrific people. I say that from my heart. I had the pleasure of working with both of them on this paper, and they're just so dedicated and knowledgeable, and I'm just so honored to have worked with them and to continue to work with them. Uh, first, we have Maura Henry. Maura is an ESL teacher at the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria. Welcome, Maura. Thank you. Welcome. And next, we have Trevor Basden. He is. <laughs> Trevor is a founding fifth grade ELA and history lead teacher at Success Academy Brooklyn II Middle School. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming them to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vivette. Thank you to everyone for coming out tonight for this conversation. I'm so excited for this. Um, let me start by bringing our panel up. Let's welcome to the stage Suraj Gopal, Emily Davis, Dana Goldstein, and Jonah Rockoff. All right, so we're going to get started tonight with a couple brief introductions before we get to questions. Um, we'll start with Suraj. Serge Gopal is a STEM special education teacher at Hudson High School in Manhattan, and he's also a UFT delegate. He was a member of the teacher policy team with uh, Vivette, myself, and Mora. And Serge actually recently had the opportunity to speak on a panel with uh, US Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. So we're going to start um, with that. Serge, if you could tell us a little bit about that experience. Uh, well, you know, I was very excited to represent the team for that. Um, and it was great. I got to sit right next to him. He's incredibly energetic. Uh, Early. Sort of has, you know, you hear about him being an All-American basketball player. He kind of talks that way, like he's on the court, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but I was really impressed with his commitment to ground-level dialogue with teachers. Him and Kaya Henderson really have close contact with teachers uh, all the time. And they're really editing their opinions according to what they hear. Great. Let's welcome Surge. Emily Davis is a Teacher Ambassador Fellow with the U.S. Department of Education and a 7th and 8th grade middle school Spanish teacher in St. Augustine, Florida. Emily, could you explain what your role is with the U.S. Department of Ed? Sure. So I am a Teaching Ambassador Fellow, and what that means is I am spending the year at the department, uh, as I like to say, keeping it real and making sure that folks at the department understand how teachers are feeling um, and what's going on in the field. And one of the the biggest pieces that I get to do is go around the nation and talk to teachers and ask them to share their concerns, ask them to share uh, what's going really well for them or questions they have, and then have a direct line of contact to bring that information and their teacher voice back to the department um, and share it directly with senior staff and also with the secretary. So um, an additional uh, ambassador program started this year, um, which was a principal ambassador program, um, which has been really exciting. Uh, to see teachers and school leaders in the department and, and how we are seeing things differently in different policy meetings through a different lens. Um, and for us, it's really been in the past, this fellowship has been sort of having teacher voice at the table and it's evolving into this, not just us being at the table, but now we are the ones that are setting the table. Um, and so it's really been great to see how this, the fellowship has evolved. So thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, let's welcome Emily. And next up, we have uh, Dana Goldstein, who's a staff writer at The Marshall Project and author of the New York Times bestseller, The Teacher Wars. Dana, congrats on your new book. I know, and I mean this authentically, despite the fact it's in the script. I am really excited to read it. I haven't yet, but I am really excited to read the book. Um, so can you just start with a really brief summary um, of the book that you, I'm sure, we'll talk about later on tonight? Um, and kind of talk about what prompted you to write it in the first place. Sure, so my book actually starts in 1830 and goes all the way to 2014. It's a history of public school teaching in the United States. It's mostly a political and a social history. I set out to answer the question, what role does teaching play 
um, in our political debate, in our public life as Americans. And one of the biggest questions that interested me was, we have asked teachers to help us close inequality gaps between the classes and between the races. Where does this idea come from? How has it evolved and changed over time? And what do we actually know about teachers' ability to actually do that? Okay. So let's welcome Finally, we have well. Jonah Rockoff. He's a professor at Columbia Business School. And he's done extensive research on the issue of teacher quality and co-authored a well-known study that linked quality teachers with long-run outcomes for students, including college attendance, adult earnings, and teen pregnancy. Jonah, your study on long-term effects of teachers was mentioned by President Obama in the, his uh, 2012 State of the Union. Why do you think the study got the president's attention? Um, I would like to say, at first, I didn't know it was going to get that much attention. <laughs> so um, I was running on a treadmill watching the State of the Union. I nearly fell off <laughs> when you mentioned it. But um, I, think we, I think there was a, a sense among lots of people that teachers matter for long-run outcomes, but there had been no study that really connected the dots all the way from observing a teacher with their students and then observing those same students later on in life. So we were able to get a, a great data set that uh, connected those dots. And I think that was why it got a lot of attention. Now, why it got mentioned in the State of the Union, I think that uh, there's a lot of debate about teacher evaluation and using test scores. And I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. But I think one of the things that everyone on both sides of the aisle agrees on that, that comes out of our study is that teachers matter. And so why is it good for a politician to mention, I think also is because we can all agree that their teachers have great value. And then we have to go to the next step and say, now what do we do about it? Let's welcome Jonah. So we'll have a few times tonight where we get to hear your perspective in the audience. And this is one of those moments. It's a question to put out to you, and we're going to take some responses by a show of hands. In your experience, how meaningful are standardized tests as measures of student knowledge? <clears throat> Give you about 10 seconds to think about that. OK. <laughs> Let's see. Who, uh, nice, and, nice and high so that we can <laughs> see. Um, who would say A, very meaningful? <laughs> Who would say <laughs> B, somewhat meaningful? OK. How about C, not at all meaningful? And D, only meaningful in the context of other measures. Oh. Wow. OK. <laughs> Looks like we've got a lot of people who say somewhat meaningful or uh, meaningful in the context of other measures. Um, Jonah, can I pose the same question to you from a research perspective? Are standardized tests a valid measure? Are they measuring outcomes and knowledge we care about? Or are they just measuring something like <clears throat> test taking ability or yeah. socioeconomic status? I mean, I think it's a tough question to answer because the idea of what is a standardized test can be very broad. I'm sure we can all look at some what we would call standardized test and say, I don't think that's capturing what we would want students to learn at a particular grade level or a particular subject. We think it's uh, too narrow, it doesn't capture deep thinking or anything like that. And there's probably also some other standardized assessments you might look to and say, we believe this is an accurate measure or a, or a meaningful measure of student knowledge. As a researcher, uh, and particularly an economist, I don't write the tests. So from the point of view of my research, and to say something about whether a standardized test is meaningful, I'm going from the point of view of these are the tests that uh, for example, New York City had been giving out over a long period of time, or uh, you know, if I'm using data from the state of uh, the city of Chicago or the state of North Carolina or other places, you sort of take what you're given. But what we can say, I think, from the research is that even these standardized measures that I think have their limitations, we are still able to show that you can use these standardized measures to look at student growth over time. And then in the study that we were talking about earlier, that student growth is linked to much better outcomes for kids later in the future. Now, a caveat there is we don't know whether it's exactly what's being measured on the standardized test or some other measure of student knowledge that is correlated with your test performance that causes someone to do later on in life. If a teacher teaches a kid how to have good study habits, they make them love to read, they do all these other things, that could still show up in the student's test score at the end of the year. And that will show up later on in life as uh, you know, a better job, going to college, et cetera. So that is a caveat. But in the research side, the standardized tests do link up to, to things that I think are meaningful. 
great. <coughs> aligned with what uh, some of you were thinking. Suraj, could you share some of our team's recommendations for improving the design of tests to ensure that we're getting meaningful data? Definitely. Um, first of all, I want to thank Jonah for helping us, I guess, start thinking about <laughs> recalibrating our notion of what a standardized <coughs> test is. Um, that's something that the team did from the very outset. Um, we were all satisfied that a lot of the research that we read uh, confirmed the validity of a lot of standardized tests as a measure. Um, I guess our proposal started with um, a real commitment to higher order questions that tested higher order thinking. Um, loosely, I'd say we all agreed that uh, questions like that, I guess, further, I guess, the purpose of having authentic classrooms with authentic types of learning. Um, in addition, we proposed uh, computer adaptive testing. So uh, students taking standardized tests on a computer that was reacting in the moment to whether or not they answered questions correctly or not. Um, so those were two big things. And then as far as teachers' roles, uh, we wanted teachers to be highly involved in both creating and vetting test items. We know this is already taking place in New York State, um, but we wanted it to take place even earlier, uh, the vetting, and also the creation, we wanted it to take place at a much higher rate. Um, so those were some of our, of our findings. And one last thing I wanted to mention was uh, a Chicago study that we read. We looked at two groups, or the study looked at two groups of students uh, that were training to take the ACT. One group uh, was sort of trained in a traditional sort of kill and drill test prep environment. The other was just taught the subject matter, possibly in a richer context. Um, and the latter group outperformed the former group. Uh, so again, that sort of confirmed something that we what we hoped would be true, which was that authentic teaching can still lead to uh, high performance on a standardized test. And I, I'd like to build on that. I think that when I was able to read the policy paper, I found it very helpful that there, there were different contexts brought into the paper. So there, there was an emphasis on special education students. There was an emphasis on ELs and, and thinking through how computer adaptive programs can really help them in these contexts. And that's why I voted D, um, because I do feel like, to both Jonah's point um, and Serge's point, it's very, it is based on context. And that's one thing that at the department is sometimes difficult to explain because, you know, they're very, um, they want to highlight what they call best practices, but I, I'm trying to change that and so that they're saying promising practices. Um, so I, I, I want to bring that context and I like sharing the stories of things that I'm hearing on the road. Um, when I, I just met with a uh, group of teachers in Memphis um, about standardized testing specifically and one teacher just said, you know, I just got a kid from Panama and he is like the best thing ever. He doesn't, he knows no English, but he will interact with his peers and he'll speak to them in Spanish and he's, he's just trying really hard, but come, you know, come March, he's just going to bomb that standardized the state test. And it's just never going to show really who he is as a person and as a student, as a learner. Um, so th there's those sort of stories that I like to share at, with the, with senior staff, um, just to sort of get back to Jonah's point, the, the alignment piece and the balance piece um, is very important and I, I found that helpful uh, in the policy paper. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Emily. All right, so moving on a little bit from the general questions of validity around testing, we're going to ask another question, right? And on this one, I'm going to add the caveat that you do not look at the people around you when you answer, please. <laughs> um, because this is going to be reflective of cultures at individual schools. We're very interested in looking at the spectrum across the city. Um, so thinking about the, the culture of testing in your school, if you were to, to use a scale from one to five, how would you rate that culture in your school? Um, obviously one being negative, up to five being positive. Take about 10 seconds to think about that. Okay, so uh, if you would rate it negative, please raise your hand. Somewhat negative. Mixed. Somewhat positive. Or positive. Great. All right. Um, so actually, I think that's a little bit. We had maybe anticipated that it would be somewhat more negative than what we saw. It seems like very evenly distributed, um, with that concentration right around and mixed. And I guess culture is sort of a hard thing to quantify, so that's not so surprising. Um, but Emily, I actually want to start with you. So we know. The education secretary has said that the culture around testing is less positive than what he would want it to be, and that's been a focus at the department recently. Um, can you talk a little bit just about the efforts the department is taking to change that and some of the things you may have heard from teachers in other parts of the country? 
Sure, and I'll start with what I have heard from parts of the country. And the bottom line that we've been sharing as, as teaching ambassador fellows is that it's just what we're doing tonight. We need to have an honest conversation about what's going on right now with the culture of testing. Um, I was speaking with a teacher and, it, and we were just like, it just seems like the pendulum just swung completely one way and it was like, all of a sudden we were facing all of this testing and it was like, where did all this come from? Um, and so I, you know, have, have shared that with the secretary and like, you know, how, why did this swing this way? What's going on? Um, and hearing directly from teachers saying, hey, you know, I've, I lose 30, 40, sometimes 50% of my instructional days for testing and, and teacher prep, or test prep, excuse me. So it's, it's not just the testing, it's then the preparation for the testing and, and, and sort of how do we find that balance. And the, the third piece that we kept hearing over and over again was the reliability of the data. Um, it was very much uh, a principal shared with me and said, you know, we test kids so much that we've just have tipped the, the balance and I don't even know what's good data and what's bad data anymore. Um, and this was a, a, an instructional leader. Um, this was somebody who was, was sharing just how he was trying to balance his PD and helping his teachers get the time they needed in front of their children and at the same time meet federal mandates, state mandates, um, and district mandates. And so when I think about solutions and I think about things that we as teaching ambassador fellows have offered um, to the secretary and said, you know, this is sort of everyone's problem at this point. Um, I have heard the secretary say in speeches that the, the federal government does take responsibility for some of this, um, but ultimately there are there is state responsibility and district responsibility as well. Um, and I think that for me, part of the solution has been talking with school leaders and noting when, whenever I met, met with teachers and they were feeling good and things were going well, it was typically because they had a strong principal in their school. And the principal was almost, I don't know the term, if it's protecting or safeguarding their teachers, but just saying, you know, hey, there are some assessments that I'm not gonna make my teachers give. There are some, uh, uh, I don't wanna use the word assessment, but there are some tests that, I, that we're already doing and that the district wants me to do in addition to, but I'm just not gonna give those and I'm just gonna sort of try to figure out a way to integrate the data that we are already collecting. And it wasn't that the, they were being defiant. You know, they were collecting the data, they had valid measures, it was just that the tests that they were being given wasn't really measuring learning. Um, and so it was, it's been interesting to, to sort of offer that and, and see a really a change in perspective at the department around school leadership. Um, and I had mentioned earlier about uh, the principal um, that sits next to me. Um, and we just, we just would love to see this culture of change be led by, by school leaders and, and helping them to, to make these difficult decisions that many times are very difficult to make. Um, but really helping districts in the meantime to be thoughtful about what, you know, what tests they're giving. Are they valid tests? Are they assessing? And really is, that, is the data you're collecting, providing and driving instruction? Um, so really helping districts be thoughtful about the amount of testing that they're giving as well. Great, and just to build off of that, sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot. You can speak on behalf of the team. I know we didn't speak too much <laughs> about the role of teachers, but um, obviously leadership is incredibly important. What can individual teachers in classrooms or teams of teachers do to help contribute to the culture? So Serge, if you want, or, or anyone else that has had that experience. Well, I think um, you can try to, to find diverse ways to attack testing subject matter, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and that really takes a lot of time and preparation, which is the bad part, but at least uh, you'll have a success story to share with your colleagues. I think that's one thing that we could all do in schools to maybe ease our minds. Um, my, my mind was eased most of all by the studies that we read that, that linked authentic learning to, uh, to high performance, uh, which means to me I can go in every day, teach the way that I want to teach, and still expect a good result. Um, so I feel like spreading that message uh, both to uh, the teaching staff, to the administration too, would make a really powerful difference. And then, do you want to add something? Yeah, I would just like to say there's two other things in the report, or the, call it a report? Paper? Paper. <laughs> Policy paper. That'll be awesome. paper. That I think also uh, could go a fair distance towards changing uh, culture, or at least the, the test prep, uh, and also additional testing culture. And one is the recommendation that we move towards a computer adaptive assessment. I think, obviously, there's other benefits to computer adaptive assessment, like more reliability for people either far behind or far ahead of the grade level. But 
It's the timeliness of the information. The state test gets taken in April. You don't find out the scores for a long time. As a researcher, I don't get the scores till like sep next September or October. So, yeah, you too, okay. <laughs> so that means that if you wanna know how your kids did and make any decisions over the summer, you need to layer on another test. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we can't get the results back in a timely manner, and I think computer adaptive testing can speed that up, will we'll do something. And the other is, Thinking about high stakes tests and thinking about what high stakes tests do to kids, to teachers, and to schools, and moving towards a system of accountability and assessment where it's not just about one test, but it's about multiple measures. Once it moves to multiple measures, once the, the, what was a high stakes test becomes a medium or whatever you want to call it, stakes test, it, it matters, but it's not the only thing, then people start to stress out less about it. They all to say, well, you know, I'm going to teach the way I teach and my kids are gonna do fine on this exam, and if they go do a little bit less good because I spent more time on something else that's gonna also improve their learning in a measurable way that everyone's gonna recognize, then I don't care. But when it's all about one test, you get all that action on test prep, I think. Dana, can you share a little bit in reporting for your book, um, what did you learn about just culture in schools mm -hmm. around testing, and, and how does today's culture compare to the history that you talked about? That's a great question. Thank you for putting up with my cough and my cold, by the way. <laughs> I have a cough drop now, so. Um, <laughs> you know, Americans love testing and measurements, and we see this going all the way back to the 1830s when I begin my book. And one of the things I always like to acknowledge is how far we've come. Um, the early school reformers, folks like Horace Mann, were actually quite obsessed with this thing called phrenology, which was testing the bumps on kids' heads. And they thought from this that they could draw conclusions about how likely you were to become a criminal or, say, an attorney, and that they would then you know, be able to direct the help to the criminal kids and <laughs> turn them around. Um, and then later on, in the, in the early 20th century, there was a huge push around intelligence testing IQ. And we know now um, how many negative policies flowed from that, in particular tracking kids into basic vocational or academic curricula. Of course, kids of color and girls were very unlikely to be tracked into those higher tracks. Um, and so achievement testing, which we've had since about the mid 20th century, earlier than that, but I would say that our policy debate around it dates back to the 50s or 60s, is really a step forward, not to blame kids for their low test scores, but to put the responsibility onto adults to make sure that children are learning and to actually connect what's going on in the classroom to what these tests are. The previous generations of testing had very little connection to teaching or learning. They were sort of about making judgments about the child. So I think it is important to acknowledge how far we've come. Um, in terms of the culture of testing, I certainly have experienced as a journalist traveling the country many of the qualms that I'm sure many of you have and were reflected to your answers to these quizzes. Um, most teachers value using tests in their individual classrooms to find out what kids know and don't know so they can better target instruction toward them. But sometimes when the drive to test is driven by the desire to evaluate adults, we end up creating tests that are not very good tests. So for example, multiple choice standardized tests in the arts which, believe it or not, many states around the country are experimenting with and which I've seen delivered to kids. I've actually also seen pencil and paper tests delivered to children in physical education classes. So we have tests that are not developmentally appropriate that are being rolled out as a response to the policy mandate to evaluate adults. And that's where, as a journalist and a thinker about the history of testing, um, I become concerned because I think that the research that people like Jonah uh, do is so valuable. And part of what makes that research valuable is that there's not high stakes attached to many of these tests in the years when we use them for research. And that's why we can draw conclusions from it. Because it, it, you have to think about testing that's either in an accountability structure or out of an accountability structure. Because once you get it into the accountability structure, then instruction's gonna be targeted to it in various ways. And yes, it's true that the research shows that teachers who teach at a high level will get the better outcomes, and that teaching to the test does lead to bad outcomes, and that message is not necessarily out there. But in low-capacity school systems, 
oftentimes that message is completely lost and the administrative pressure is to teach to the test. We have uh, one more audience question for you. It's actually referring directly back to something that both uh, Emily and Dana um, touched upon, which is how often do you use testing data to improve instruction? So think about that for a moment. All right, let's see if we can, by a show of hands, how often do you use testing data to improve instruction? Always. Okay, a few. And often? Occasionally? Rarely? And never? Okay, it seems that we had a concentration there at often and occasionally. Um, Sarah, you uh, spoke about our, some of what our team was saying about this. Um, and how it was connected with culture. How about um, in your own classroom using uh, data to in inform your instruction? Oh, well, well, just like we talked about expanding our notion of what a test is, um, I feel like we should also be encouraged to expand our notion of what data is. Um, you could take it at any time, you know, student's demeanor uh, when, you, when you talk to him or her in a certain way. That's a piece of data as well, you know, and equally valid to their performance on a quiz. Uh, so I feel like I, I, I use that on a daily basis, especially uh, working with a lot of students with disabilities. Um, I feel like I need to be very thoughtful in the way that I approach them in the classroom. Um, they don't want attention drawn to the fact that they're getting extra help very often. Um, all this is very important information that I classify as data. So every day, all the time, I'm using data you know, in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, Emily, could I get you to put on your teacher hat for a minute and just talk about your own experience perhaps in the classroom using data? Absolutely. So I, I don't think my experience in the classroom is typical. Um, uh, even just talking to Mara backstage, I've been teaching 11 years. I teach middle school Spanish. I've taught high school Spanish. Um, and, and being from Florida, of course, my teacher evaluation is based on my state ELA and state math scores of my students. Um, and 50% of that, for that matter. Um, so me becoming a data expert was imperative to my survival in the classroom. Um, I, I didn't really know what to do about like seven or eight years ago when I was like, what am I gonna do with, I have to start proving that I'm a great Spanish teacher because on paper I'm a really good math teacher. <laughs> and you do not want me teaching your kids math. So I think that I didn't really know what to do. So I went out and I wrote all these grants and it really shouldn't be the way a teacher has to try to get things done, that we just go out and we have to write all these grants. And the reason I wrote the grants is I wanted to have technology in my classroom because I saw that as a way to get real-time feedback. And I wanna be careful here too because I feel like this happens a lot at the federal level is that there's a real confusion around assessment and testing. They, they get intermixed and used interchangeably at, at the department, and it's, it's difficult to try to, to, to help a policymaker think through the difference between that. And Serge just said it, you know, we assess kids all the time. From the minute they walk in, we, I mean, we're assessing their behaviors, we're, there's things, we're making 150 decisions in an hour. And so I think that um, as much as, I went out and got all this technology and I'm, I'm using real-time data in my classroom and it really is just driving it. It's more, it's more of the formative, iterative data that I'm using in real time to adjust what's going on in my classroom. Um, and so I, I want to I help be conscious too that this assessment is this ongoing data that we are collecting um, and testing is this really arbitrary one point in time. Um, and for us to, to help policymakers and ed as teachers think about assessment being the journey, right? Because that's where the learning lives. And, and helping them understand that the assessments that we are doing day in and day out are really what should be driving our instruction um, and the data that we're collecting from those sorts of assessments and not just this one time arbitrary piece of data that comes at a time when it, it doesn't matter anymore, right? When it's six months down the road. Thank you. Teacher hat. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I think um, <clears throat> this seems appropriate given 
what we're sort of dancing around. I want to talk a little more specifically about how we use data in evaluation and accountability systems. And Joan, I want to start with you. Can you just walk us a little bit through the research that exists right now in how we use student achievement data from standardized tests as part of an evaluation system? Um, is that helpful? You know, some of the research I know on the team we came across is that accountability systems broadly show a lot of positive results for students in the long run. That when there is an accountability system in place, and this logically makes sense, right? That if there are stakes to a decision, you see that um, in general outcomes improve. But what does the research say about the use of specific tests one single day or one single test item in evaluating teachers? Okay. Um, I think that the results aren't all that surprising, which uh, are the following. If you look at, and generally the research is done in math and ELA assessment, because that's where the assessment has been. Again, the are not making the tests, we're taking the ones that have been given. But you also see research done uh, in science and a couple other subjects at the high school level. But in general, okay, we find that these assessments um, are meaningful measures of teacher performance, that is teacher um, uh, performance in raising student achievement growth. And these assessments uh, are reliable enough so that after you've observed a teacher for a couple of years, you can have a decent amount of predictive power to see how that teacher would do if you give them another group of kids in the following year. Do they also do well in terms of measures of growth? Um, now, what are the limitations of that? They're a bit obvious, right? Which is one day of a test is not going to capture the full amount of what kids learn during the school year. And one test cannot possibly capture the full breadth of the curriculum of what, teacher, of what teachers are giving to kids over the course of that school year. So, these tests capture potentially an important dimension of what kids learn, but they cannot fully capture all dimensions. Uh, moreover, one test has noise. Just like if I was to show up and observe you in your teaching for one day and evaluate you based on some kind of rubric for how well you taught that day, that's just one day out of 180 days. Okay? So we cannot possibly think that one observation equals a full year of teaching. One test cannot fully capture a full year of learning. Yet. I think we'd all be, uh, would feel odd if I said one day of teaching tells me, one day, one day of observation tells me nothing about whether you're a good teacher or not. Just like we'd say one test can't tell me nothing about student learning. What we have so far is evidence that testing, I think, is a, a fairly reliable and predictive measure of teacher performance. And what I mean by that is it tells me who is going to do well in the future, which is what I care about when I'm asking myself should this teacher stay on? Okay? Or what should I do to make sure this teacher stays? Should I work hard to make sure they, can, they stay in my, in my school or in, in, my, in this grade? But there are clearly limits. And I don't think these limits surprise anyone because of the kinds of measures that we're using on the research side to, to make these performance uh, metrics. And Dana, I want to go to you next, because I know you started to speak about this a little bit. But in your book, you talk about some of your skepticism about using um, standardized tests and student growth scores to evaluate individual teachers. Can you explain a little bit more about where that skepticism comes from? <clears throat> and the technically complex systems are often very, very poorly implemented by districts and in schools. And the hopes um, that reformers have for them and the way they're used in a research setting are not translated on the ground. And I always say it sounds like a banal point, but it is an important one, um, which is that the more complex these systems are, the more opportunities there are for them to go awry in that translation from research into practice. That's the nature of my skepticism. I, I don't believe that we should stop standardized testing kids. I think we need to have testing in our system to know what kids are learning and to understand how schools are doing. But we need to be, or at least I feel from the research I've done, that we need to have a little bit of caution about the sticks and carrots that we attach to them. Go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm very scary about the BAM conversation. Um, <laughs> So I completely agree, and I'm just I you know I'm adding to to Dana's point that it's it's also very I I started polling the 
Florida VAM formula. And I mean, I tried to understand this algorithm and it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, but I wanted to know where my VAM score came from. Um, and it was this like 10 decimal digit um, with a minus sign in front. So I don't think that's good. Um, <laughs> and of course it was published, right? So it was online in Florida. And this was something that I was, again, you know, just wanted to know, you know, was I a good teacher? Did this mean I wasn't a good teacher? You know, does this reflect my observation? Just really doing some reflection as a professional to try to figure out where I was in this metric. Um, but I think that the piece where, you know, what I really, again, liked about the, the paper was that you said you guys fall in the rational middle, or I believe that was the term, <coughs> which is so right. It, it's, it's, you know, we don't, as educators, we're the ones who made tests, right? We're the, that, that's, that's our thing. We're, we're the teachers, right? Teachers make tests, right? That's, there's always been that way. And so it's how do we balance and, and keep that standard baseline of data and really use it for instruction? I mean, I can't even imagine what that really could look like for our students if we had this baseline data. Um, and so one of the, the, the issues I have as, as a Spanish teacher is, is again, this teaching the whole child, you know, teaching and, and how do we in create this, this atmosphere where we are teaching the whole child and we are using several different growth measures um, and multiple measures. Uh, but having a baseline of data is where I really struggled because I am judged on something that I don't have a baseline data on. Um, so I'm, that's something that I'm very passionate about and trying to get to the bottom of. Still researching. <laughs> All right, Serge, I think this is imperfect for you because luckily our paper is supposed to outline exactly that, right? <laughs> how to do this and do it better. So can you kind of outline the team's recommendations in regards to how we use testing and assessment to make a better evaluation system? Right, um, so I guess the first thing I would say is that we were comfortable making it a piece of a teacher evaluation. Uh, how big or small that piece is, we didn't really specify. Um, I know in, in New York right now it's 20% for the local measure. 20% for the end of year high stakes measure, if you, if you like that term. Um, but uh, we didn't put a number on it, but we were comfortable because of what we felt about validity of tests uh, for it to remain as a piece of it. Um, as far as evaluating a teacher properly with that piece, uh, we advocated strongly for multiple years of data you know, to account for changes in student population that a teacher might um, encounter. And then uh, in addition to that, we advocated for a lot of principal training about not overemphasizing uh, the effect of the local measure in the end of the year test um, when they were factoring in how well a teacher was doing uh, in the classroom, which we know studies show uh, if students are performing at, a low, at the low end uh, on high stakes tests, uh, they, get, they tend to get observed, or, or sorry, their teachers tend to get observed. Uh, much lower, or rated much lower based on observation than teachers of students who are performing high on standardized tests. So we were very sensitive to that. Um, one other thing I wanted to back up and point out that I feel like is important to this as well uh, is the whole rollout of data from tests. Um, we advocated very strongly, again, for early rollout of data, uh, dedicated data specialists in schools that could help teachers parse this data, use it to change their lesson plans. Um, so we felt like that was a very important piece as well. Um, and as far as VAM, uh, you know, we looked at it several times, thinking about it still kind of makes my head hurt. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, we felt very comfortable, I guess, with, uh, with what it represented, even though we couldn't really do the math ourselves. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good that. thing. I think that'd be yeah, a good thing to us. admit. But, uh, um, I, the way that I try to explain VAM without math is to say, um, we can all see a student's performance on some uh, test, okay? We all know that, actually I don't even know, the new Common Core scale has a lower range. On the old test in New York State, it was something like five, six hundred points on the end of year math exam. Was, so, so you look at a kid and you say, okay, Johnny got a 620 on the seventh grade math test this year. And the big question that comes out of that observation is, should I be happy with that number? Should I be angry about that number? Mm -hmm. Should I be indifferent about that number? What does that number mean? I think that, mean, that number means nothing without some context for, well, did I expect that Johnny was going to do much better than 620? And if I did expect that he should have gotten much higher, then maybe I need to look at what happened to the instructional 
process during that year and say, where did it fall apart? Or maybe it was something else that happened outside of Johnny's classroom and home that, that made him do poorly, but there's got to be something that caused him to underperform. Or maybe I was expecting something much lower than 620, and I'm ecstatic that 620 was the score. That means the teacher did a great job, the school did a great job, or whatever else happened outside of school, he actually learned something this year. Okay? Without some framework to figure out what is acceptable, what is a good level, what is a benchmark, what is a standard, then the testing data means nothing for thinking about performance. It tells us something about where somebody is, but it has, tells us nothing about how well a job we've done as a system, as an educational system, in educating that child. So the whole idea about VAM is trying to set for each individual child their own specific benchmark, their own specific goal for whether we are happy or sad when we see their end of year test performance. Because we shouldn't expect that all children will be at the exact same level at the end of seventh grade if they started out at very different places at the beginning of seventh grade. So that is what VAM is all about. Now, in order to do that in a way that people find acceptable, we need pretty complicated statistics. Yeah. We need to use a bunch of data on where kids were at the beginning of the year. Where were they last year? Do we know anything about that kid you know, growing up in poverty? Are they an English language learner? Do they have an IEP? All these other factors that might say, hey, I'm happy with a 620, or I'm not happy with a 620. And the math, I'm sorry about the math, it's, but, it, but, it, but it's hard. But the goal of it, the goal of it is to do a better job at saying, look, we can all see the end of the year test scores, but if we're going to make judgments about performance of the school system, we need to have better benchmarks for thinking about where those test numbers should be. And just to, just to clarify, before you uh, do that, just for everyone, because I don't think everyone's totally clear, VAM, just to make sure we define the acronym, stands for Value Added Measures, right, for people that may not be familiar with that. And the point is exactly what you said, where it's trying to isolate the value added of individual teachers or of schools, right? So you want to look at how did they improve that over time. So now go ahead. Oh, and I just wanted to clarify my point. The problem with complexity is not that the math is complicated because the more complicated the math is, probably the more valid the measure is because we are able to look at the child's socioeconomic factors in addition to their performance in school, and that is very important. The point I'm making is the system that is created around these measures often with all the other measures that go in are very complicated. So for example, exactly what you were saying, so many teachers are in these shared attribution systems where the value added scores that they're being judged by are not their own student scores in the own subject that they teach. And we actually see that in New York City and it's actually even more prevalent in other parts of the country. So that creates an absurd situation in some places. I have interviewed teachers in Florida actually whose evaluate the, the test scores that are coming into their evaluation are from children they have never met. The children are actually ones that were in the school in a previous year, they're a new teacher, the third grader sat for the test. You can see how this would happen, I don't have to explain the whole scenario for you. But it's, it's the complexity of the overall evaluation system which can sometimes lead to problems, not the complexity of the formula that's used to calculate it, the value added part of it. I sometimes feel like we should just take that part out and look at it on its own. And then we can have a whole conversation about classroom observation and, and all these other things and acknowledge that we may not ever be able to get to a point where 100% of teachers can be evaluated using these tools because some grade levels and some subjects may just not lend themselves to this type of evaluation. Can, can I just uh, add one thing? I sat on um, uh, a panel as an advisor when the regents were discussing some of the evaluation systems in New York State and I think um, you know, I was torn in many ways in thinking about how we approach evaluation uh, because in many ways the state of New York and other state governments are pretty handicapped in their ability to distinguish how we're going to evaluate one set of teachers versus another. All this research that I'm talking about, a lot of it has been done on, let's say, elementary and middle school math and English teachers. So we might be very confident, if we can at least tell, figure out which kids were with which teachers, <laughs> okay, that, the, that this system could work for them. But should it work for an art teacher? Or should it work for somebody else? Or a PE teacher? Who knows? Right? We don't have a lot of research base to go on there. But unfortunately, when you're this, the regents, you can't create two separate systems of 
teacher evaluation. I would love it to say, look, let's, let's evaluate the math and the English teachers in this way, and then everyone else gets a totally different system. Or maybe we don't even care about evaluating the PE teacher performance in the same way. I don't know. But in, according to state law, a teacher is a teacher is a teacher, and we have one system for that. And I think you know, some of the really bad parts of these state laws end up because you're trying to do a one-size-fits-all evaluation system, and that is not, that, that's not an ideal approach. To right, so I want to that. <laughs> it seems like people broadly agree, right? We can come to some consensus on the validity of tests that are well-designed, and that some of these metrics, while complicated, are giving us valuable data, right? But where the breakdown comes is how we design the systems, aside from the tests themselves, but the evaluation and accountability systems, how that data is then used to inform mostly high-stakes decisions, right? Um, so with that in mind, and this would be for anyone, do you have any uh, examples in mind of districts or states that you think are doing a really great job in the way that they are using testing and assessment data as part of an accountability system, or are we, we not quite where we have an exemplar yet? <laughs> I don't know if we're, if we're far along, off in t along in time to make that judgment. I mean, I feel like one of the, um, I mean, a lot of stuff has been rolled out very quickly, uh, and people have have mixed feelings about whether that's a good or a bad thing. Um, but I don't think researchers have caught up yet to give us a very good uh, understanding of, of who is doing this really well. And I mean, we're just starting to see stuff, research coming out about the DC uh, evaluation system, about the impact system. And that's been in place for, you know, preceding a lot of what's been rolled out across the country. So it's going to take a little bit of time, at least from my point of view, for researchers to catch up with policy, which is normally not the case. Normally, policy lags behind research. I think here, that's a case where research is going to have just need to catch up. And then I guess maybe from people that have spoken to teachers on the ground, if the research isn't quite there yet, just from a teacher's perspective, where are teachers happier with their evaluation system or with just the culture of testing and assessment, whether it's individual districts or statewide? I think that, and I don't want to sort of pinpoint a specific district, but I've, I traveled quite a bit in Tennessee. Um, and to Jonah's point, I mean, Tennessee was a race to the top state. I mean, they've been implementing, they were one of the first rounds of race to the top and, you know, have invested a lot of money into trying to figure this whole thing out. And um, I feel like, again, it's it's this capacity issue, right? So there's these really great, there's this great, there's research and it's, it's, it's just the capacity to do this work. Um, and I think that where, some districts in Tennessee are doing really well is that the district has really looked at the context and said, and really sat down as leaders of that, the local level and said, what should we be doing that is specific to our context? So uh, back to the DC point, you know, with, with their impact and their evaluation system, I think it works really well for DC. Um, and I do think that we should highlight places that are really trying to do great things with teacher evaluation. Um, but I do become very fearful then again that um, you know, states will try to do that one size fits all and, and really try to, to say, well, let's just do what they're doing in DC and, and really try to pick it up and move it. It's like taking a highly effective teacher in a really great school and just saying, hey, you're highly effective here, so if we take you to a high need school, you should be highly effective there, right? It's, it's making sure that knowing that why they were highly effective in their first school was probably because they had supports in, uh, in structures and systems put in place because that which made them highly effective and if they're going to a school where that's not the case then then you're going to see a difference in instruction so I think that that's just something that I know there are several examples in Tennessee um, Memphis and Chattanooga being one of them that are really trying to turn things around at the local level, which I thought was very empowering, um, just trying to make it fit to their context. I'd love to build on uh, some of her points about New York, actually. Um, the thing you said about uh, pulling a highly effective teacher into a high-need school, uh, that's something that is new to New York City, at least. Um, and that made me tremendously worried, actually, because I, 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 I just thought through the steps in my head, and I was like, this teacher's going to leave be a new context, their new colleagues might be resentful of the fact that they're getting this large pay bump for, right. for being there, um, and it might destroy a culture, and then not help kids on top of that. So I was really upset about that. Um, on the other hand, I guess, and this is where we go off paper, I guess, but um, you know, I, I felt like the Danielson side, the observation and artifact building side of my evaluation uh, went really well this past year. Um, I had a lot of close contact with my principal, um, 
whom I looked at before, and I was like, you know, she has a lot of strengths, but maybe classroom evaluation is, is not one of them. Um, she wasn't very eager to do it, but within the new system, she became a lot more eager. Um, she gave me a lot of really valuable feedback about my artifacts, so I was very happy about that. Um, I'd love to talk to some of the other people in the audience about that, just yeah. hear their, their feedback. I think maybe before yeah. we get to questions, if we can do just one more that I'm curious <laughs> about. So we've talked a lot about teachers um, and evaluation systems and how data can make sense to educators, but I think a lot of the anxiety around testing also is shared by families right, and parents. And so how do we take all of these kind of nuances that we've talked about and communicate that? to families at home so that parents also know what these scores and these numbers mean for their own children. I, I mean, I think that it's just transparency. Um, and it's really even just bringing in food and saying, hey, let's sit down and talk about what this means. Um, I Even talking about the Common Core rollout, they just many times are feeling incredibly left out of this conversation. They're feeling that you know, they don't know how to do this math or and just bringing them in and being very transparent with them I think is is important. I, I met with um, a group of teachers that were trying out this new model and they were they did their own data in their school and they were like, uh, you know, we don't have any technology but we noticed all of our kids were carrying around smartphones. And so what we just started doing was taking all their phone numbers and just texting their parents stuff every, every night, just texting stuff, and then the parents were getting it, and the kids were getting it, and they were just, just being conscious and realizing how students and parents were getting information um, really changed the culture of their school. Um, and they just started seeing parents then not just dropping their kids off at the door, but were coming in and, and feeling more welcome and, and invited into the school just because they had thought about you know, how to be transparent about things and started family literacy nights um, where the, the first half of the evening was to describe things like this, you know, have them ask questions that they were, they were uh, grappling with and then the second half of the night being addressed to, to some other piece of instruction. So I think that we have to be transparent with parents. It's just like telling, you know, we want teachers at the table. We should be at the table. This is, this is what we, this is how we make transformational change. And so I think that when we bring the parents with us, that that's, that's just creating that community change that we all want. Yeah, I think that this would be a great time to open it up to uh, you in the audience uh, for questions. Trevor and I will call on people and a microphone will be brought to you. So you don't actually need to move to the microphone. I just ask that you keep your questions uh, short and make sure that you get to a question that ends in a question mark. <laughs> That's a good ESL teacher. <laughs> um, right over here on the side. Uh, do you think that uh, extra test prep is really worthwhile, especially for the bottom third? Hmm. Serge, you want to start just from the team's perspective, and then we can have anyone else? Sure. Uh, succinctly, the team's perspective is, is absolutely not, for the most part. Uh, we'd love to target, I guess, test-related items um, obliquely, you know, through a more rich instructional model than direct test prep. So that was, that was the conclusion that we came to and we're very, very satisfied with. So I shouldn't sign up for Saturday school. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Absolutely not. Unless you want to just maybe enjoy your Saturday, read and have a book discussion, right? I think that would be really beneficial. I think that's what we came to is like, mm -hmm. absolutely should give as much instructional support to like the most struggling students, but that should be the most authentic curriculum that's aligned to those standards, but is not doesn't look like a multiple choice like test prep item. That ultimately is not going to get them the result you want anyway. That's what seems to be the consensus among the research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about right over here in the middle, black tank top? Um, hi, um, I was just wondering, so you talked a lot about, first of all, authentic teaching, and I think you kind of addressed that in his question and in your chats. Um, my question is, you know, we talk a lot about this value-added measure, and as an art and music teacher myself, uh, who certainly advocates for and values the holistic child, um, you know, we saw with No Child Left Behind, we saw this, and, and Race to the Top, we saw this testing, 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 and then every year that a school hits the benchmark, it moves higher and higher, and what that actually kind of resulted in was cheating and invalid test scores. Do you find now with the introduction of Common Core, and I think this is a question really for you working with the Department of Education, do you find now with the Common Core and like in the research that you've done, um, you know, I guess are, 
are we looking at a federal level? Are they taking this more into account? And are these test scores and these value added measures really being considered at the federal level? I would say yes. Um, I, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, I think that, especially with the scandal that, you know, I immediately think of Atlanta, obviously, but I don't want to call anybody out. But I was, um, <laughs> I mean, that was, as an educator, that was just frightening to me. And, and I have heard, you know, policymakers and even in, in the paper address, you know, what these high stakes tests do. Um, and I, I want to share sort of my race to the top, no child left behind question that I had for some policymakers just because the clarity wasn't there for me. And um, she sort of presented it to me in a way, you know, whereas I think it's the unintended consequences of good intentions, right? I think that there, there were and are good intentions around what is best for kids. Um, I will tell you that being at the department I was surprised. There are some incredibly humble people there that will will say, "What do teachers say? What is going? You know, what are? How do they feel? Um, is this the best thing for kids?" Um, and even the secretary, back to Serge's point, will just sit down with us and say, "You know, how are people feeling? Are they feeling pressured? Is this is this putting too much accountability in the wrong places?" So I will tell you that there are some very honest and humbling conversations that happen at the department, um, and. For me, it was kind of figuring out that No Child Left Behind really sort of put the pressure on schools for accountability. And then it seemed like Race to the Top really sort of put the pressure on educators. And so it was, it was an interesting, I mean, I don't know if that was the intention, but that's kind of how I, I have interpreted it and as my perspective. So I can tell you, yes, there are conversations that go on. Yes, there, there especially even in the higher ed space as well, there are conversations around concerns for cheating and that, and that sort of space, but I, that's about the extent that I have inv been involved with that. And I don't know if Serge wants to talk about the recommendations in the paper. I thought it laid it out really well. Yeah, I, I, probably the biggest recommendation was going to computer adapted testing, which really prevents um, any sort of gaming of, of test scores. Um, but beyond that, you know, uh, the comments that we raised earlier about promoting a positive culture around a test really would would do validity and um, principal training about the studies that we read around uh, authentic teaching, authentic learning, and higher test scores again would would address that. Those are our three big ones, I'd say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right up here in the back. What do you do about the pressure that kids are feeling that? You know, there was an article, I think, in New York Magazine last year about the kids that never wanted to go to school anymore because of the tests and, you know, getting sick so they didn't have to go to school. What, I know what you're, you're saying is that's what you're talking about, the culture of the testing, but how do you, how do you address that? And I know that there are some really good public schools. I have a friend at one of a really good public school in the city who has told her students to opt out of the tests. And won't that penalize the kids in the long run? Can I actually speak to this one? Fantastic I, question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, um, it's a fantastic question, it is. I'm thinking about, um, I'm so, I teach English language learners at my school and um, I'm the only ESL teacher, so when it comes time to administer the nicest slot, I do it myself. And it comes, um, if you're familiar, in May after my students have already taken the state ELA and math tests. So um, nicest slot comes around, and uh, they immediately do the tense up again, more testing. And the way that I try to avoid the stress of it is to, I actually don't do any preparation. Um, and I know that that's sort of counterintuitive. Won't they feel less stress if they are more prepared? We spend two class periods, 90 minutes, preparing for the nicest slat, just looking at the format of it. And over and over, my mantra is, everything we've done this year has prepared you for this. Um, I also like to think of what Chancellor uh, Farina said, which is the best test prep is good teaching. and. By that time, we have created trust between us. I can tell them, you trust me, I trust you, we're gonna be fine. And luckily, 
for me, I, I, have a, I have great faith in the nicest slot, actually. So uh, when, they, when they take it, they say, oh, yeah, it wasn't that bad. And they get results that they um, feel confident in. So they carry that to the next year. But I really feel that actually less test prep and more just general academic confidence. You can do this. We've prepared all year. Um, we're not just testing uh, some specific thing on this day. It's everything that we've done, and you're going to be uh, just fine. I know that that's sort of a general answer if anyone wants to. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to pick it up. Um, you know, I, I, I teach ninth grade, um, so kids are always coming in and adjusting to high school for middle school. And I think maybe from what they've heard from their families, older brothers, uh, they have a lot of anxiety around what high school means on an academic level. They're very excited socially, uh, but academically, very often they're terrified, you know? Um, and I guess it's like most of my approach is just about making school a place that they really want to be. Um, so being there early before, uh, staying after, um, just kind of hanging out with them, talking to them about what they like doing, what they don't like doing, making sure that my own assessments at least are very diverse, so they have a lot of opportunities to maybe do something that they think that they're good at. Um, and then, you know, kind of if you build this community where they always want to be, uh, at the end of the year, you're like, well, you know, it's kind of like home. Sometimes you don't like setting the table. It's just sort of like that. Uh, but every other day, I hope that I've at least made you feel welcome. And even if you're tearing your hair out throughout the test and after it, uh, I'm still going to be there. So that's kind of my approach to it. Yeah. I love what both of you are saying, and I think it's so crucial, because as a journalist, I've been able to visit classrooms all across the country. One of the things I've seen is you'll go into a classroom, and on the whiteboard, it'll say, our big goal, high scores on Colorado's standardized test. I just chose that randomly, but um, there has to be a more inspiring big goal for the students than that. That's going to cause so much of the anxiety, and I think some of that culture which has penetrated uh, the classroom is what parents are reacting to. So we have to inspire them with something that's bigger than the test, with the great teaching and the focus on the curriculum and all the social factors that we know also impact kids. And then when the test day comes, it's not this huge buildup that's been obsessively focused on and talked about just constantly the entire year, and that makes the testing day more valid so that we can draw conclusions from it. Thank you, Dana. Yeah. Great. Hi, we talked a lot about how testing can be used as an accountability measure um, and as a measure of learning, but I'm wondering if any of you think that it can be used to actually improve schools and if we can start to use testing to not just confirm the achievement gap, but start to close it. Um, yeah, would you, yeah. I, I think that it really depends on what kind of testing we're talking about. Um, to be honest, I am not, um, I'd like to be more optimistic, but I'll profess not being super optimistic <laughs> about end of year statewide standardized assessments, even ones that are, we think are much more uh, closely linked with what we want our kids to learn, like PARC or other things lined to the Common Core for telling us how to improve our instructions. There's the timing issue when we get the information back, but also you're trying to cover a large number of subjects, and nobody wants their kid to sit for a week of exams. Okay, So the constraint that says we're only going to have a couple of days of testing, and we want to cover everything that we, should, we think a seventh grader should have learned in mathematics this year, means that we only get a small little uh, printout of what they've done on, these, on all these things. And I think that the kind of assessment that teachers do during the year and their ability to use that data in real time and learn from it holds a lot more promise for improving instruction. Because I want to know how the last unit went and who didn't really get it. Because when we go to the next unit, they're going to really struggle if they didn't get this one. And there, you get a much more in-depth picture because you're only testing a small slice or you're only assessing a small slice of what's going on. And so I'd love to think that the, the end of year kind of summative, how did we all do this year thing could be used for instructional purposes. And maybe there's something there. But I, I'm worried that it's kind of a, it's a thin slice of a lot of things and not a, a deep enough dive to tell teachers 
uh, enough information to make meaningful changes. Um, great. Uh, right in the middle here. Hi. Um, I'm a sixth grade teacher in the Bronx, and I was formerly an inclusion teacher. I teach general ed now, but um, in my heart, I'm still a special ed teacher. And <laughs> so I, you know, when we talk about testing, I get often really frustrated. Um, and I'm sure the SPED teachers can relate to me in that way. But um, I want to go back to something that Jonah said. You said that research showed that assessments are meaningful and reliable measures of teacher performance. And I wanted to know how that relates for a special ed teacher yeah. because I constantly feel like a lot of my students are making tremendous growth, but they're still making ones and twos on the state exam and not passing. Yeah. Additionally, many of my students' IEPs are, um, their disabilities are emotionally, behaviorally disturbed, and you can't test that, yeah. even though I think that's one of my strengths as a teacher, and yet I'm getting ones on my on my test scores that are coming back to me, and that's reflecting on me and my teacher evaluations. So just want to see what kind of research there is on special ed teachers. OK. Um, I'll say a, a few things in response. One is, just because you make a one or a two on the test doesn't mean the teacher did a bad job. That's clear. I think we all would agree on that. I think that uh, testing uh, what I would call social cognitive skills or assessing Let's not use the word test, but assessing <laughs> progress on social cognitive skills, particularly for those kinds of IEP students, is very important. And even if it's not done at the statewide level, at the local level, I think that's a very important thing that people should be thinking about doing. Um, what does the research say? I think that we have not that much to say conclusively about um, the sort of uh, special ed only classrooms. That is, kids who are not mainstreamed, um, we don't have as much of a good research base to go on for some of the research results I've been talking about. Because these kids don't take the standardized assessments. They're taking the alternative assessments. Or earlier in time when we were looking for a lot of this data, they were taking, they were just not taking, they're just not in the database. Okay? So we've looked at kids with certain IEPs and kids that are, that are, that are mainstreamed, and those uh, kids are, I think, were just as valid looking at teacher performance and educating those students. But let's face it, that's a certain slice of the SPED population. It's not a lot of those. In New York City, for example, the District 75 schools, very little testing went on in many of those schools for a long period of time. And we don't have a good sense of whether a value-added measure is going to be linked to the long-term outcomes that we look at for the rest of the population. I can't say for sure, because we just we didn't have the data. Um, so. I'd love to say it works just as well. I can't say it because I don't think we have the data. But I think instinct tells me you're going to need different sets of assessments for these kids. Or you're going to need to an adaptive assessment regime, like a computer adaptive assessment regime, and different um, accommodations for certain kids and how they're being assessed uh, in order to get a valid measure. You can take another one right over here. Uh, let's go with the scarf first. Thanks. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, so we've talked a lot about the high stakes state tests, um, but I teach first grade and I know a lot of early elementary. And so there's this trend moving in New York State. Um, it's the measures of student learning, the Mosul. And the choice for math is like a paper and pencil multiple choice test. And I'm just curious what the research says about appropriateness of that kind of testing for early grades and what your recommendations are for kind of these assessments and for K and one and two. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that, there, look, there is, there is some research, uh, an early study that I did with New Jersey schools. We, I went as low as uh, kindergarten and looked at these assessments. They're much less reliable in kindergarten because getting a kindergarten to sit for a test for a long period of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, whether the new assessment is the right way to evaluate the first graders with a pencil and paper test, I, I don't really know the answer to that question. I feel like it, it goes a little bit back to what I was saying about one size fits all. And you know, we have 
you know, 20% on this, 20% on that, blah, blah, and everyone has to get the same box. They have to, everyone has to fit in the same box. And I also think, to be honest, it's about money. Uh, if you wanted to seriously assess the first grader, you could probably do it with a one-on-one, -on -one in-depth assessment. Uh, it would take a lot of time and a lot of resources. And pencil and paper tests are cheaper, let's face it. And so you have to make, I'm not saying that necessarily is a bad thing, but you have to recognize there's a trade-off here, which is if we're not going to fork over the money to get a very highly reliable, in-depth uh, assessment of all our first graders' math ability, then we go with the cheap stuff, but we treat it for what it is. Right? We say this is not a full measure, this is not a multi-dimensional measure, this is a very quick snapshot, and we don't put a lot of weight on that, whether for high stakes for the kids or for the teachers, we rely on other things. But again, if you're trying to say everyone gets the same cookie cutter approach, it makes it harder to have those kinds of serious weighing discussions about what, we, what we're gonna hang our hat on and what we're not going to. And I think the only thing I would add is, as a team, we didn't really address the issue of testing in the earliest elementary grades, but I was a third grade teacher. Um, and so thank you to the first and second grade teachers <laughs> in the building, right? I think part of the reason that was so complicated is as we, at the same time, we're trying to distill and say teachers should be responsible for their own students, right, in the accountability regime as it exists. I was also getting credit for the work of first and second grade teachers as a third grade teacher. Like, I could tell who among my colleagues had had certain <coughs> students and what they were coming to meet with. And so I think it's, it's an incredibly complicated process to fit into that system, but it's part of the reason I don't think we, we took too much time in that, given <laughs> everything else that we covered. Um, there isn't a lot out there to look at for those ages. I've done some journalism about this question of how you assess really young children. And the Erickson Institute and a few other places have come up with models for this. And it's not a multiple choice paper test. It entails an adult, one-on-one -on -one adult to child, and doing things like, can you show me the letter B? And you know, this can, some of these things can work even with pre-K kids. But it, it doesn't look, it's an assessment. It's not a test. It doesn't look like a traditional test. I'd love to follow up with you. I don't know much about early learning, but I know it is a priority at the department and there are some really great early learning leaders there, but I would love to try to answer your question. I would love to ask them your question and be able to try to give you a response. So I'd love, love to follow up. You're welcome. And your neighbor here was yeah. patiently waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you've talked a lot about testing. Could you tell me if you have different views on English language testing versus math testing in terms of validity, in terms of long-term reliability, about your conclusions or your observations about it or your recommendations. I think we tend to lump testing all as one thing. As a math teacher, I think there are very different issues about math testing versus English testing. Uh, um, what we found in this study that looking at long-term outcomes was that although the amount of signal we could get from the standardized tests in ELA was weaker than the signal we could get from math tests about how well could we predict how well a teacher is going to do in the future. On, on. It turns out that from a long-term outcomes perspective, the impact of the English teachers was actually seemed to be greater than the impact of the math teachers. Mm -hmm. That is, it wasn't clear. You could, you, a single English teacher didn't seem like they could move those test scores tremendously far the way a single great math teacher could. but what does that do to the, your prospects of going to college and having higher earnings later on in life? It turns out that the English instruction seemed to be very important. Um, so uh, there, you know, that, that, that means you know, that's a complication for, for us in thinking about um, how much weight you would put on these kinds of assessments, mm -hmm. given the difference between short-term and long-term. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is one of the most fascinating small parts of your research, and I've thought about it a lot myself, because what we know is that middle class and affluent parents spend a lot of time reading with kids at home and have the time to do that, and that our more disadvantaged kids often lack that, and so oftentimes with those disadvantaged kids, it's easier to move those math scores with a really great teacher, because everyone has, almost everyone in America has a deficit from home on math. Very few parents are focusing on that. <laughs> so I, I found this just so fascinating in terms of thinking about the impact that teachers have over the long term with students. 
Um, I would just add that I guess in my own experience, I've had more problems, I guess, like personal problems with English or humanities tests, like language-wise, uh, than math tests. I guess, obviously, um, there aren't as many opportunities to make linguistic decisions when you're writing a math test as there are if you're writing an English test. Um, our Mosul last year uh, in, was a persuasive essay prompt about the best, I guess, what are the best criteria for an invention to be a great invention? Uh, and I had a big issue with the word criteria because a lot of my students just mm -hmm. didn't know what that word meant. Um, so I guess the, the one thing that I've thought often is that English tests, at least in, in urban ed, um, are inadequate from a language point of view. Um, and I've had less issues with, with science and math tests uh, in that regard. I think maybe on the flip side of that, just briefly also as a third grade, again, you teach math, reading, all of these things all together. Um, students that I had in a gen ed setting that were ELL, who were brilliant mathematicians, struggled to show that because of comprehension issues and not because of a math deficit. And then that was reflected in that test also. So I think that there are cases where that is like that. And so something that we actually recommended in the report is trying to make sure that we have less of these tricky math word problems Mm -hmm. um, and if it's trying to assess a math skill, that it should be aligned to that, and the item should not be tricky to comprehend, because then you're measuring reading comprehension on a math exam, right? Which I think as a math teacher is probably where some of your frustration comes. So trying to make sure that whatever the item is actually aligned to is what we're hoping to gather data from. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, in the back, you've had your hand up for a while. I, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, oh, that's loud. Um, I'm a middle school principal, and the reason I'm here is because I really agree with a lot of the policies that Educators for Excellence have, but I struggle to figure out how to implement those things in my school, because especially when it comes to testing and assessment, a lot of those decisions happen not even at the district level, but at the state or the city level. So um, I guess my question is, what kind of actionable steps can I take on the school level to support the policies that you're suggesting? Emily, you had been talking about principal leaders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, um, and again, not as a principal, but I would love to follow up with you as well um, and connect you with the principal ambassador fellows. But I think that. What I have found staggering in schools is, and I don't know how you do that. I, I don't know how you politely push back against superintendents within your district, and I know that that can be political and scary, but what I can speak from um, as, a, as a teacher leader in my school is that when, the, when I have, Whenever it seemed that my principal was grappling with things, we were all brought to the table. And it was kind of like, how do you, you know, I, I was upset about a budget cut one year and, and I was taking it very personal. And my principal knew I was upset and she brought me in and she laid the budget out in front of me and she goes, what would you cut? And I went, oh God, I love that and I love that. And, and, and that was empowering. Um, and I don't know if that, that can be sort of applied, you know, um, within your school or you know within your district but I feel like where I have met some really strong leaders in their schools they have really just sort of laid that out there and brought everyone to the table and had a really honest conversation about some of these really hard decisions that need to be made and I know that sounds like such a very generic answer um, but that's just been uh, my experience but I do have a few people I would love to connect you with as well. And I think that that contributes to the culture, right? Yep. So like, what do we have the most control as, as educators in the school environment is how can we create a positive culture despite policies that may not be what we would recommend right. um, until they're changed, right? When That's they read right. this, obviously. That's right. Um, until then, how do we create that culture? And I think transparency is a huge piece of it. Even I think I have always respected leaders that have come to me and said, you are going to do this, not because I think it's the right thing to do, but because you, I know you have to do it. You just have to do that. And that kind of honesty makes it way more positive than an edict on high that you know is irrational, but isn't being acknowledged as that. And the other piece of that too is that I, my principal was in her you know, last two or three years and, and she was wanting to make sure that when she left, the school would continue on down this great path. And 
um, she created this distributive leadership model in our school where there were all of a sudden 14, we were terming them teacher leaders, but these were the, we were sort of her groundhogs in like doing this work. Um, and it wasn't extra work, it wasn't just another thing on my plate and that I wasn't getting paid for. It was work that was autonomous and meaningful and we were able to work as a team um, and see changes in our school. And so I know teacher leadership's now this new, it's not a new thing, but it's becoming its own thing all of a sudden. Um, so I think that that is something I'm very passionate about and, and thinking through distributive leadership models, um, which have also been very successful in a lot of schools that I've visited across the country. I'm going to hop in here. Um, I think this question, your question, um, speaks to the, the core of the work that we do at E3. Uh, we started by talking about our model of learning, networking, and taking action, right? The, the writing of the paper, having these conversations, the reception to follow, that's very much the learn and network component of our work. The taking action is also critical, right? Because we just learn, if we just network, we build a great community, but unless that community acts together. And so in your school, I'd say, sit down with your teachers, build that distributed model. E for E loves to come in and help facilitate those conversations. We, we, we build the norms that we discussed in the beginning to help facilitate sometimes very difficult conversations so we can keep, um, keep the conversations productive and solutions oriented. So we're happy to come in and, and facilitate those conversations in every school through your OD and frankly train every teacher and every principal to have the skills to do that themselves within their, within their school. So I think, and, and the next step is once we build that movement, as we build this movement, when you have a collective of, of teachers and principals who are asking for, for recommendations for ways to improve what's happening in their various school, you find a very receptive audience at Tweed, you find a very receptive audience at the State Education Department, you find a very receptive audience. I think what we've seen is for too long, teachers have just been kept out of this process. Right? And so there isn't, we, we don't have a, a rhythm of doing this sort of work. The usual voices are heard in Tweed, they're heard in the State Education Department, they're heard in DC, but teachers are often not those voices, and that's the very nature of the work that we're doing at E3, and it actually leads me to the action cards that you should all have on your, you should have been given, right? So we've learned we've networked, and now there's an opportunity to take action. So you see we have four or five things um, that you can, you can sign up to do, some with, with varying levels of, of intensity, depending on where you are. Um, I want everyone to take a moment, Think about, imagine yourself going back to your school tomorrow. Which one of these things do you want to commit to doing? That's cool. And then take a moment, you know, have some think time, have some write time, oh. fill it out. We'll be, we'll be collecting it at the, uh, as you leave. But just take a moment to fill, to fill out those action cards now. We've learned, we've networked, now let's commit to taking some action. Feeling really bold, tell your neighbor if you work together. <laughs> oh, there it is. Welcome aboard. <laughs> That's a great idea. So now, before we wrap this up, and the conversation certainly isn't over because we're going to be going to the reception in the hallway. I just wanted to thank the panelists once again. I mean, I, I was excited. <laughs> I think it's incredibly rare to have academics and journalists and teachers on the same stage having a conversation, getting into the weeds, getting really nerdy sometimes. Like, that's <laughs> rare, and I think it's something that, that we love to do. And so again, I want to applaud the panelists and the authors of the paper we're going to invite everyone to go into to join us outside for reception to continue the conversation. And um, to, on the way out, please, uh, you'll see um, at both corners, someone has a basket. Please drop off your, your action commitment cards. We'll see you outside. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, the panel. See you outside. Thank you.